welcome to Rico 12. I'm Justin, your host and a beautifully imperfect, stumbling, bumbling child of an absolutely powerful and perfectly loving God and an addict. Rico 12 is all about exploring the common threads of addictions and sharing tools and hope from those who are on a similar path. We gather from diverse backgrounds, faiths, and places to learn and support one another. Our speakers represent various fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, thus showing the common threads of recovery no matter where we are. Today's speaker for the 249th meeting is Catherine M., who is a first-time RICO 12 speaker, and I look forward to hearing her message entitled, Sobriety is Surrender, here in a few minutes. First, just a little bit of business. RICO 12 is self-supporting, and your contributions help us continue our mission. Thanks this week to all those who contribute and who have been spearheads now and in the past for supporting the RICO 12 cause. There are real costs to running these services. The web hosting and podcasting hostings are the major ones. And if you feel moved upon to donate, your help is much much appreciated. (laughs) To support RICO 12 and become a spearhead, visit www.rico12.com forward slash support or click on the links that I will put in the chat and in the show notes uh, here for one-time or monthly donation options. Your support makes a difference in keeping us able to share these messages of recovery. We look forward each meeting to receive, receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, Catherine M., and give just a little background on her. Catherine joined a food fellowship in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2014. Five years later, she happened upon Anorexics and Bulimics Anonymous and got sober from, from unhealthy eating practices on the 9th of November, 2019. She now lives in the UK, and her home group is the ABA Australia Zoom group that meets Monday and Wednesday at 6 p.m. Sydney time. I'm I'm excited to hear from you today, Catherine. Take the floor. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. I'm just going to see if I can do this timer here. Okay, great. Okay, I'm just going to say the serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. Be you in charge. Amen. So yes, I'm Catherine, and I'm in recovery from anorexia, bulimia, and compulsive eating. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really honored to be here and to have this opportunity to carry um, a message that really saved my life. Um, so what it was like, I have memories of my eating disorder dating back to being a very, very young child. I was four years old when my parents got divorced. And I somehow made that about me. Um when I went to go and see my dad, um, I felt like an intruder. I felt like I didn't belong. Um, my stepmother and I never had a good relationship. And so I felt unsafe when I went there. And food food was my comfort. Um, from a very young age, I would use food to control my feelings. Um And it's that sense of ease and comfort that the big book talks about. And that's what it gave me. Looking back, this this sense of control showed up in other areas. So when I was was around like five, six, I remember becoming absolutely panicked about my socks. And the seam had to be absolutely perfect. It couldn't rub my toes. And I would spend ages in the morning getting ready and trying to fold my sock this way or that way and become quite worked up because it just didn't feel right. You know, and when I did my hair, I would, you know, brush my hair and, and make a ponytail. And then the next thing there would be a bump. And I'd be absolutely like devastated and have to do it again to the point that my arms were actually hurting, you know, from from holding this ponytail. And my mom would say to me, Catherine, no one cares. 
And I, I thought, yes, they do. They are all looking at me, you know, and this is from very, very young. So, so I was, I was incredibly self-conscious, although no one would ever think so because I, I presented as an extrovert. I was confident. I was loud. I was opinionated. But within me, I felt like I wasn't good enough. And our literature talks about self-hatred being at the core of this disease. And this feeling that I wasn't good enough then got projected out into my body and my body wasn't good enough. And so I started with my, with my eating disorder to try and control what my body looked like, how much I weighed, what I ate. So during my disease, I went through various phases. I, I did a mono food phase. So during my teens, I just ate peas at one time. I just ate popcorn at one time. I just ate uh, nutri grain bars. And then in my 30s, I would literally have an enormous bowl of popcorn and a tin of oysters for dinner, right? Um, I went through phases where I seemed to, you know, stop. I stopped binging and purging, but I, I never stopped trying to control my body weight and shape. And so for a period, I thought that I was okay. And on both occasions, I did that for a man. So, so a man became a higher power and the fear of losing them sort of forced me to stop. But I was still doing all of the other peculiar controlling behaviors. Um, while I primarily identify as a compulsive eater and bulimic, I went through two very anorexic phases. The one was the end of my high school um, year. And basically, I just drank tea and smoked cigarettes and um, studied on diet pills, which in those days had pseudoephedrine in them. And, um, and I, I lost an enormous amount of weight. And then again, when I was in my 30s, I, I did an apple fast, you know, to, to cleanse my emotions. And I ate apples for 14 days and drank herbal tea. Um, and so even though I don't identify as anorexia as being my my sort of um, my go-to I learned in this fellowship that anorexia is the restriction of my food intake and and that I definitely did do and I also learned that restriction leads to binging so all that restricting you know trying to ooh, cut back on a snack here don't you know don't eat all of that you know, don't have any, don't have any treats or anything that would then lead me to binge later. And when I binge, I have to purge because I'm absolutely terrified of putting on weight and I have to control what my body looks like. I, there were phases where I was binging and purging five times a day, every day. And then there were phases where I was binging and purging once a week and sometimes once a month. Um, I always had rules, many rules around what I ate. So no carbs and protein. I can never have that together. I can't have carbs after, after three o'clock. Um, I have to drink two to three liters of water every day. And, and that can sound very reasonable, but the difference was that if somebody asked me for a sip of my water, I got really angry, like, how dare you? Don't, don't touch this water. How am I going to monitor how much I've had? You know, so it's that control again. Um, then I... I had things like I could eat sweet potato, but not normal potato. I could have coconut blossom sugar, but I couldn't have normal sugar. You know, if I went swimming, it had to be two kilometers. There was no like, you know, um, 1K or, or just, you know, splash around. It was like, no, no, 
When we get in the water, it's very, I had a very defined sequence of what I did when I went swimming. And so I was active in my eating disorder for 24 years. Um, because I actively started binging and purging when I was 14. And, and during that time, from about my early 20s, I started to, to do something about it. I, I started to try and stop. And I used willpower and resolutions. I was in psychotherapy for nine years. I went on to Prozac three times. And that was really interesting because the first time I went on it, I was in my, I was around 20, 24. And all of a sudden, my head became silent. And it, it was only in that moment that I realized how obsessive my thinking was. I, I, I wasn't aware of it. I just thought that was normal, you know, and, and the when am I going to eat? What am I going to eat? Who's watching me? Am I going to purge? Are they going to come check? You know, this concept, what time is it? Oh my God, I have to eat. You know, this, this, this incessant noise in my head and it just stopped and it showed me like, whoa, <laughs> there's a ton of crazy that is going on inside my head. Um, I tried acupuncture. I tried kinesiology. I tried vitamin shakes. I saw a spiritual therapist. I did plant medicine. Um, I even joined a food fellowship. Um, I was in a food fellowship for, for five years. I worked the steps three times. And people always just used to say to me, just, just get through the steps and you'll be fine. And I was like, okay. And it didn't work. I was still binging and purging. And I thought, what the hell? You know, like, what's going on here? Um, and so I just resigned myself to the fact that, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to be, you know, acting out in my eating disorder periodically for the rest of my life. And, and that's just the acceptance that I need to have. Um, and so, yeah, I, looking back, I, I see that it, it was so hard for me to let go because I was so heavily identified with my body. I, I was my thin body and I had to be thin because that was the value that I brought. It was the, the gateway into you liking me and you giving me a chance. If I didn't have thin, I didn't have anything. It was like, oh my God, you'll never want to get to know me. And so I used my body as bait to lure people in, to try and have that sense of intimacy, which of course never worked, right? You don't have intimacy through that. Um, and so I reduced myself to a body. I objectified myself. And, and I really thought that thin was a superpower, you know, and, and that was an old idea. Um, I then met, I met someone when I was 38 and I, I completely fell in love. And five months later, I was moving in with him. And on the day that it was happening, we got a call from his mom and she needed to come and stay with us. She had gone through an incredibly messy and violent divorce from an alcoholic. And she needed her son's help. And my partner said to me, you know, how do you feel about all this? And I said, this doesn't feel good at all. Right. I could only think about myself. I was so rooted in fear. Right. This this wasn't conscious at the time, but it's only through doing the steps and taking inventory that I see that having her in my space meant that she's going to get to know me. She's going to see through me. She's going to see what a bad person I am, and she's going to turn her son against me, and I'm going to be all alone, right? And so I was not compassionate at all. I was unwelcoming. I was selfish and self-centered. 
And it naturally caused a huge rift in our relationship. It just went from bad to worse to shit. And a friend of mine um, who I knew from the Food Fellowship came to visit me. And she said, you know, friend, if you don't get your eating disorder sorted out, it's going to affect your relationships. And, and it was playing out in front of me. It was like, God, this is this is what's happening. And that evening, you know, after about eight, six to eight weeks, I don't remember it exactly, you know, of, of not binging and purging, my head was in the toilet. And I thought, how the hell did that happen? I I was baffled. And I I in that moment, I knew that I and powerless that I am not doing this by choice. And even though I had been in a fellowship before, I, I said, yes, I know I'm powerless, but I didn't know. I still thought that I was doing it by choice. And when I realized that, I, I had this sense that I was being held hostage by the disease. And it made me feel incredibly uncomfortable, you know, that I was never in control. It was controlling me. And I felt icky, you know, just like, oh, God. And, and it wasn't a conscious thing. But in that moment, I surrendered. I completely surrendered. Um, I had tried. I hadn't tried everything, but I had tried enough things to know that nothing works with this disease. And... It wasn't dramatic, but it was really me asking for help and being willing to receive help. I didn't ask a question. It was an internal thing that just happened. And so she said to me, she said, why don't you try EDA? And I said, okay. And so I went into Google and I typed EDA, but God's in charge and up popped ABA. And I thought, that's strange. Like, what is this ABA thing? And Anorexics and Bulimics Anonymous, I thought, oh, my God. Like, I didn't know this existed. And so I went and I read the preamble. And that preamble said, the drug of anorexia and bulimia is the feeling of being in control of our body weight and shape and food. It also said that this is an illusion of control because it controls us. We're, we're never actually in control. It told me, no, it stressed what the solution was. And I say stressed because this line is in bold, italics, and it is underlined. And it says, I have to surrender all control, all of my body shape and weight and food to a higher power. And it told me that sobriety is surrender. And it just, it spoke to me. It was like, oh my God, it had nothing to do with the food. It had nothing to do with my weight. It had everything to do with control. And there was a shift in me that just, it's just like, yes, this is where I need to be. This is this is my solution, you know. Um, and so I went to my first meeting. And it wasn't long after that that I found a sponsor. And I, I said to myself, right, I said, this sponsor is God in skin, right? This is my higher power speaking to me. And whatever she says, I'm going to do. I'm going to listen and follow. That's my job right? I'm going to listen and follow. And I did. And she said to me, Catherine, you need to go and see a dietitian, right? And when you see the dietitian, you need to tell her that you are a master manipulator, that she is not to ask me what I like to eat, right? It's up to me to say, listen, you need to tell me what I need to eat based on my height, my weight, and my medical background right? My job is to eat it. And I did that. And she, her plan had carbs five times a day. I said, wow, <laughs> that's a lot of carbs. And she said, yes, and you're going to eat all of them. I said, righto, you know, and I did. And I did that. Um, 
My sponsor said to me that I needed to surrender exercise, right? She said, put down all exercise and you're going to walk four to five times a week gently for half an hour. You need to move. You need to get out there, you know, have a change of scenery. And for me, it was actually quite a relief. It was quite a relief to not have to go running, you know, that like, oh, that absolute dread, you know, like, oh, I don't feel like it, but I have to, I, I have to burn this off, you know. Um, and so I I let that go. I then had to let go other vestiges of control. And these did not happen all at once, right? These happened as I became aware of them. So things like body checking, chewing and spitting, chewing gum, using sweeteners and stevia, weighing myself, filling up on tea and coffee so that I don't have an appetite. Um, she said to me that I needed to surrender to what's suggested, right? So what the dietitian suggests, that's what I need to eat. The dietitian's plan is not the Bible, though, right? It's a, it's a, it's a suggestion, right? Because in addition to following her suggestions, I needed to surrender to what served. So that means that if you invite me around for dinner and you're serving beef lasagna with extra cheese, I say, yes, please, that sounds lovely, right? I needed to serve to, uh, I needed to surrender to participate, so that when it's someone's birthday and they're all having a piece of cake, I too have a piece of cake, right? And that was my surrender. If I'm going to the movies and everyone is having a bowl of popcorn, I have one too, so that I'm participating, not with my little packed lunch that I have to eat on the side, you know, because I'm so special and different. Um, she told me that I needed to serve, I needed to surrender to what's available. So if my meal plan says chicken, but I don't have chicken and there's fish, it's okay, I can have fish. But before I do that, I call someone, I say, hey, this is the deal, you know, this is what I'm going to do, you know, and they say, yeah, that sounds fine. Or they say, I'm sensing control there, you know, like give me a bit more background. <clears throat> so basically in what we call step zero, which is this getting sober phase, it was about me having no choice, you know. And it's, you know, listening to all this, it's like, oh, my God, how, how do you do this, right? And that's honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. I had to be willing to take the action. And, and the other how is God, right? God keeps me sober. I had to develop a relationship with, with a higher power. And even though I, I wasn't, I hadn't started the steps as yet, my sponsor said to me, you need to do steps one, two, and three every single morning, right? You need to get down on your knees and say, God, I'm powerless. I'm powerless over binging and purging, restricting. I'm powerless over exercising and not exercising because I'm also happy to sit on the couch, you know. Um, I'm powerless over chewing and spitting, body checking, weighing myself. But you have all power. Please, God, please will you restore me to sanity. I give you my thinking. I give you my life right? Like, like really feeling that, like nothing has worked. I am truly powerless and I need your power to, to help me to stay sober. I needed to pray before meals, right? To say, please, God, keep me sober. Please help me to eat everything on the plate and have a full stop after I've eaten, right? And as I did that, you know, one meal, one day at a time. So I started to gain some sobriety. Now, when this happened, because I put down all control, which is my drug, my emotions started to come up. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, my partner ended up breaking up with me, right? Because, um, yeah, I, I don't blame him one bit. So two months into sobriety, he broke up with me. And I was literally on a in a heap on the floor crying every second day. It was intense because 
I couldn't blame anyone. It, it was me. Like I was left with me and it was incredibly uncomfortable to sit with that. Um, my, my body had a physical reaction to getting sober. So I would, I would have severe bloating, nausea, no appetite, raging hunger, constipation, you know, then my body started changing. And because of the body dysmorphia, you know, a slight change is magnified. So it feels so intense going through this, you know, it's like my identity is being like ripped away from you, basically. And so I, um, I had to reach out, you know, and I remember phoning someone and just being like, I'm so pissed off, you know, I was angry that I was putting on, putting on weight, you know, and, and she just said to me, like, can you buy bigger pants? And, and, and there was something that just dissolved the anger. It was like, yeah, you know, yeah, I can, I can totally do that, you know, because I'm willing to go to any lengths. Um, and about six months into sobriety, I remember thinking, oh, I'm so bloated, I'm so bloated. And then realizing like, you know, this is my new stomach. <laughs> this is what my new tummy looks like. And that's okay. And um, I had the thought, like, I, I'm really enjoying this recovery thing, but you know what? I'm going to just lose a few kilos, you know, work the steps and just you lose a few kilos. And I realized, like, I played the movie to the end, like, control is my drug. I can never, ever safely lose just a few kilos again. I can never, ever safely try and tone my arms or do anything like that. And so there was a deeper surrender that happened in that moment. Um, so I, I needed space to do my recovery because of all these emotions that were coming up. I wasn't working at the time. And, you know, I started seeing clearly for the first time. It was like, wow, I'd been in a fog, you know, um, for so long. And, you know, this talk isn't about the steps, but... I worked the steps and those steps changed my life, right? The magic is in the steps. And, you know, it was like, oh, my God, I, I started to see my part, you know, and, and, and I love the steps. I love the big book. I love program. I love ABA. You know, it, it's, it saved my life and it is an incredibly deep, spiritual pathway you know that I'm, I'm I'm grateful that I have an eating disorder thank god I have an eating disorder that I, it brought me to my knees to find this pathway that has transformed my whole life you know so so now what things are like now I'm neutral about my body I am completely okay with what I look like I don't fuss about it I went up one size and you know what? It's none of my business what my body looks like. If I eat three meals and three snacks, if I surrender to what's served, to what's suggested, to what's available and to participate, my body is going to end up at the weight and shape that it is meant to. I don't need to go fiddling there. I can eat what's served. No matter what, I have no opinion. As it comes, I don't need to say dressing on the side, as it comes, I'm totally fine. I don't obsess about food. Um, it's it's not a thought for me. I eat and then I get on with the rest of my day. Um, you know, I'm I'm not a normal eater, but I can eat normally when I surrender, and that is a gift of this program. Um, if I need to exercise or move my body, I can do that without obsession, and I just pray, God, please show me how to walk soberly. You know. Um, my partner and I got back together. <laughs> that was by the grace of God. Um, my stepmother and I had a, a really tumultuous relationship, but words were never spoken. It was the seething resentment underneath. And it took me five rounds of the steps. She was always on my step four, <laughs> but it, it was only round number five that she made my step nine. And I finally made amends to her for my part because I could see it then. And now we have a relationship, you know, like <laughs> it's just, yeah, insane that we have a relationship. 
Um, my partner describes me as flexible. <laughs> you know, that is a miracle because he always used to describe me as controlling. Um, and, you know, the, the most important thing is that I have purpose. I actually have purpose now. And my purpose is to carry this message and to work with others and to practice these principles in all my affairs. You know, I'm I'm useful. And for me, there is nothing better than helping someone to have a spiritual awakening. It's like nothing comes close to that. You know, and I feel enormously, enormously blessed that I, I get to do that and have a life where I'm free of the obsession and the compulsion of an eating disorder. So that's my time, and I'll leave it there. Thanks. Catherine, thank you so much for sharing this. There were so many insights that I gained. I put down, I wrote down a bunch of questions that we'll get to. I would like to remind our live audience here, if you have a question for Catherine, please put it in the chat. If you'd like to remain anonymous, I mean, if you just put it in the chat, I'll announce you by your first name when I ask the question. If you want to keep anonymous and not have your first name uh, read out, uh, direct message it to me and we'll get to those and I'll read those anonymously. But Catherine, there are so many questions here I have because, well, I I like one of my uh, addictions is a food addiction. And right now I'm dying in it. I'm not doing well. Um, and I'm trying to take back control or I guess, you know, I want what I want when I want it, how I want it. And uh, and, and it's killing me. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was that you said I was my body. My body was my identity identification and how I identified. And, and what I'd like to ask is who and what are you today? If your body isn't you, what and who are you today? So I try, right, to be to be an instrument for my higher power. When I get those body thoughts, I catch myself in, a, you know, the reflection of myself when I think, God, those thighs are huge. I think that's none of my business. Because I can't trust my thinking, right? My thinking lies to me even four and a half years sober. It still tells me that I'm fat. So I'll never know what, what I actually look like, right? So I, I I park those thoughts. I don't entertain them. And I do my best to say, what is God's will for me today? God's will for me is to, to sponsor like a whole bunch of people to get to meetings, to do service, you know? And so my identification as I do that I'm getting out of self and moving into my higher self, right? And, and that's what I want to be identified with, with the spirit that's in me, that's moving me to do this. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Catherine. Another thing you mentioned that, you know, as I put myself um, maybe in someone else's shoes, maybe in my own shoes, and maybe trying to put myself in your shoes from, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, you said, hey, you know, I just walk a handful of times a week, gentle walk. Um, the, I'm not out there swimming two kilometers every time I hit the water. I'm not worrying about toning up my arms. I might say, hey, is that being healthy? Is that taking care of your body? And kind of come back at it like that. Talk to me a little bit about how you, how that works in your life now. Yeah, so so when I when I surrendered, right, if exercise is a problem and, and none of, not none of us, most of us don't think that exercise is a problem. I didn't think I had a problem with exercise because even though I would swim two kilometers, I only did that three times a week, you know, sometimes twice a week. It wasn't like waking up at five, um, you know, to go and run 20 kilometers. But I could not be 100% certain that I wasn't doing that to control my body weight and shape. And so I had to let it go, right? And our literature says that we have to surrender it so that we can get it returned back to us, but with freedom attached, so that I know that I'm not using that as a sneaky little control mechanism to control my body weight and shape, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So, so now much exercise yeah, for ahead. me, sorry, that was the second part of your question. Exercise for me now involves walking. It's not a set thing. It's it's a lot more fluid. I've become a lot more flexible as I've been sober for longer. 
I felt inspired to go for a run about six months ago. I did. It was fantastic. I loved it. I felt inspired. I felt God in me. I thought, great, I'm going to do it a couple more times, which I did. I loved it. And then the rain came. And it rained for weeks. And I thought, okay. And, and it went out of my head. I didn't think, how am I going to replace the running? I have to go running in the rain. Oh, my God. I didn't panic. It was just like, okay, that, that was it. And I haven't been running since, you know. You know, that surrender is is powerful. The surrender that you're experiencing in this um, and coming from somebody who was, well, without knowing it, controlling of everything without recognizing it. Um, one of the questions I have for you, and let me, here it is. I have to surrender all control of my this, that. Sobriety is surrender. So what are you still, are you still tempted to control anything in your life that may be disconnected directly from the, the 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 food, the anorexia and the body control, are you still tempted to try and control things? I mean, I control my partner all the time. <laughs> he, he bears the brunt of it. But, um, you know, I've, I've had bits of control that has been revealed to me. So, so more is always revealed, as we know. And I'll give you an example, right? So, my job is quite physical, right? And so I would say, oh, you know, it's physical, so so I don't need to walk as much, right? Then I would eat something that was heavier or more calorific, and then I would get this idea, oh, I need to go for a walk tomorrow because I haven't been walking in a while, right? And, and actually what was happening is I was wanting to burn off that meal, right? And it's, it's sneaky and subtle how these suggestions come in because it seems really plausible. Like you said earlier, it's for health. You know, I need to have good health. I need to look after myself. Um, and, and the truth is that, you know, how much exercise do we actually need? You know, like what, what's the line here? You know, because often it's, it's far too much. And so when I saw this, and, and this happened, you know, quite a few times, but then when I saw it, you know, often it's here, you know, kind of like niggling just in the peripheral. But when I looked at it and went, hey, are you sneaky sausage? I said, no, I'm not going for a, a walk. I'm not doing that. It doesn't matter if I haven't gone for a walk because my intention is to burn food. So that's it. And when I did that, that need dissolved right that need to dissolve it just it just evaporated and that's the beauty with surrender it's like you don't fight it when you let go and you keep letting go it just it just fizzles you know yeah thank you for sharing that Catherine that's it's powerful and it's what I what I personally need to hear and I think a lot of other people will will gain this gain a lot from this um what is your take on the concept of alcoholic foods you know in some in some food fellowships that's something you know for example you know i don't know flour or sugar or whatever is something that i have to stay away from or it triggers the allergy in in what you're sharing it doesn't sound like at least in anorexics and bulimics anonymous maybe there's that that discussion of something that triggers the allergy talk to me a little bit about that right so it's, it's vitally important to know what my problem is, right? So in a food fellowship, I'm powerless over food and I have alcoholic foods that I need to stay away from, right? So my problem is the alcoholic foods that I'm powerless over and the solution is abstinence, right? Don't touch your red foods. And I know I had a list of red foods myself. Um, but... In Anorexics and Bulimics Anonymous, what we say is, and that's fine, by the way, food fellowships work for people that identify themselves as food addicts. That's that's absolutely fine. I'm not a food addict. I'm a control addict, which means that I am powerless over wanting to control my body weight and shape and food. And it comes in all sorts of ways, right, where it's like I, I like to fiddle with my food plan. 
Oh, I don't want the banana. I want the apple. I don't want to eat it at 11. I want to eat it at 12. I don't want to have the, the chicken. I want to have this, you know? I want to get creative. Like you said, I want to eat what I want to eat, when I want to eat. And don't you tell me how, you know? And I come up with all sorts of lovely justifications to do that. And that's the control, right? And so a really good way of describing control is like, Imagine, you know, an alcoholic, right? Whether an alcoholic is drinking wine or spirits or beer or, or shooters or cough syrup, it's all alcohol, right? It's all alcohol. For me, as an anorexic and bulimic and compulsive overeater, by the way, I definitely identify as that. My drug is control, and control has all sorts of little hats and disguises, binging, purging, restricting, weighing myself, chewing and spitting, body checking. So when I start to, when I jump on the scale, that's me trying to control my body weight and shape. Why else would I want to get on the scale? Who on earth needs to know their weight? You know what I mean? Like, unless I'm an astronaut, you know, like I don't need to know my, my, my weight. And so when I start that, it triggers that mental obsession. And I think, oh, oh, goodness, what's happened? And, and then the next thought comes, you know what? I think you should have a salad for lunch. That's a good idea. Oh, yeah, that's it's healthy. You know, salads are really good, right? And a run, you haven't been running. And, and so that's that's what activates. And before I know it, I'm using my drug, right? Because it's insatiable. I want more. And so I have to surrender the control. Food is neutral. There are no good or bad foods, right? There's no good or bad foods. It's my thinking that makes it good or bad. And my thinking classifies, classifies foods as, is this going to make me fat or not? If it is going to make me fat, it's bad. If it's not, it's good. And when I restrict to eating only good foods, I end up binging. And when I binge, I purge. Uh, the, this is really powerful and clarifying for me. I really appreciate that. Um, we, we do have a request in here that said they'd like to know more about joining the, uh, or looking into ABA. Um, can you give us a little information as to where people could look to find out where meetings are, when they are, and how to learn more about it? Yeah. Um, can other people post in the chat box? Okay. So, so maybe someone from the fellowship could just post our, um, web address, in the chat box and our meeting flyer for our home group, which is the Australia Monday, Wednesday group. Yeah. Okay. And, and my number's actually on that um, flyer. So people can get in touch if they've got any questions. Perfect. And for anybody listening to this podcast wise, just send an email to Rico 12 pod at gmail.com. I'll get that over to you. And I'll also post the link to the fellowship in the show notes of the meeting so that that's there. All right. Very good. Uh, another thing as well is I would, my book is very worn. I would really suggest that anybody with an eating disorder read this book. It it was just like, I mean, I've highlighted it to death because it, it, it goes through the thinking, right? Because this disease centers in my mind, right? This is all about my thinking, and, and when I read these pages, it was like, oh, my God, I didn't, it like put a label to things that I, I didn't even know was a thing. And I'm like, I do that. that. That's part of the eating disorder. That's not me being like weird, you know, that is just textbook case eating disordered stuff. And it was very comforting to see that I'm not unique and special, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. just, you know, textbook and and that book that you held up is the Anorexics and Bulimics Anonymous textbook, second edition, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay. And yes. I just looked that up on the website. So I'll post that link in the show notes also. Yes. So, no, very yes. good. Thank you for, yes. for sharing that. Excellent. Um, so, Catherine, um, you know, you, you, you hit on this. Restriction leads to binging. And, and, you, and we're talking about this specifically in... Uh, you're in in your addiction with anorexics and bulimics anonymous. 
Um, I also see that as a similar thing with other process addictions, for example, sex addiction or something like that. Can you share, speak a little bit more on that subject of restriction leads to binging? So, yes. Why am I restricting? Right? Why am I trying to restrict my food to control my body weight and shape? And when I tr- when I engage in the drug of control, I want more, right? So then I restrict more, but then later I I, I don't I can't handle it. I, I end up then binging and then I purge, right? Because it activates the addiction, right? When I pick up, that physical allergy is triggered. And when the physical allergy is triggered, I'm completely powerless. I can do absolutely nothing about it, right? A question from our live audience. What do you mean by purging? Is that vomiting? Vomiting, yes. So so I would vomit, but um, with bulimia, purging can also be using laxatives, diuretics, and exercise bulimia, where people then, you know, engage in like rigorous exercise to burn off food. It, yeah, it all I, falls under bulimia. Yeah, and I think that purging in other... Um, you know, a binging and then purging would be like, you know, I just binged on, you know, something else in my addiction. I'm I'm a gambler. For example, if I'm a gambler, I just went out and I gambled and purging would be, uh, um, absolutely, uh, falling into myself and saying, I will never do this. I'll never do that. I'll never do this again. And, and really restricting everything for a long period of time. I think that's how that might look. Any thoughts on that? And the thing is worth restricting. I'm powerless. I don't have the power to do it. But if I did have the power to restrict, right, in a healthy way, I wouldn't have an eating disorder, right? I'd just be able to say, no, I'm not going to have that, and it's fine. And some people can do that. They can safely have salads. They can safely do a juice cleanse. They can safely fast, you know, do intermittent fasting. That's fantastic. Likewise, I am not an alcoholic. I can safely have a drink, right? I don't drink often, right? You know, like when my mom comes to visit for Christmas, great. But, you know, I can do that safely. I can have one and then say, you know what, I've had enough. But when it comes to controlling my body weight and shape, I cannot safely pick up control, right? Yeah. I'm playing Russian roulette. I'm playing, I'm playing Russian roulette. If I get on the scale, I'm playing Russian roulette because, Maybe it it won't trigger the the crazy, and maybe it will, right? Where I go straight into relapse, and I don't always come back from relapse. Not everybody comes back from relapse. And so I don't want to fuck around with that, to be perfectly blunt. Pardon my French. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine, and your French is pardoned. (laughs) (laughs) Bethany from our live audience asks, would you be able to repeat the sobriety concepts around people and connection? It's something about if it's offered, et cetera. Um, talk to us yes. a little bit more about that. Yes. So um, it's surrendering to participate, right? So that when I'm out at a social event, right, I don't take my little packed box of carrot sticks and hummus. If they are canapes, I get someone to either serve me a plate, right? Because I don't know how much, or I copy someone. I see what a normal eater is doing and I copy them, right? I pray on my knees in the bathroom before and I call someone to say, listen, I'm in dangerous territory. You know, canapes, oh my God, that's just, (laughs) that was always a really difficult one for me. Buffets and canapes and picnics were like off to the races. Um, you know, and so I, I I surrender to what everyone else is doing. Um, if I go to someone's house for dinner, I surrender to what they have served. I don't, it's not the Spanish Inquisition. How much oil did you use? Oh, geez, that's very cheesy, you know. Is the salad, does it come with dressing? I just, I just accept as it comes. The same at a restaurant, you know. I eat what's on my plate. Um, I don't try and fiddle. Um, yeah, and that creates, that restores that connection because I was always so separate 
from others, you know, I had to eat at one o'clock and it had to be what I made, you know, and, and when my girlfriends would say to me, yeah, we're going to eat around three, the rage, rage, and like venom would come up like, like who eats at three, you know, now, if that happens, I call someone, I'm like, listen, uh, this is the story. And they say, great, just have your snack first. You know, just, just swap your snack around. And I go, okay, cool, thank you. Yes, I can do that. I have my snack and then I eat at three with everyone else and there's no drama. Love that. And I love the surrender of control that you're that you're demonstrating and sharing with us. Um, another question from our live audience. This comes from Zach. Zach says, thank you, Catherine. I sometimes find myself having obsessive thoughts about my recovery program. I think I am feeling restless and irritable, so I need to go to more meetings. I need to make more calls. I need to get a new sponsee. How can I distinguish between healthy and rigorous recovery, taking the actions that will help me versus an unhealthy obsession with trying to use recovery to fix me? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And it's something that's come up for me. Um, I, I recently started working with an Al-Anon sponsor. And I said to him, oh, you know, this thing came up and oh, you know, and it's it's okay. I didn't reach out the first time, but then I did. And um, so it's not so bad, but I'm just I get so worked up in the moment. And he said to me, so what could you have done? And I said, you know, I, I could have paused. I should have paused, actually, you know. He said, yeah, and what else? I said, yeah, yeah. I could have reached out. I, I mean, I did the second time, so that's progress, right? He says, he says what else? I'm like, um, he says, you know, this is a spiritual program, right? And I'm like, oh, my God. I laughed. God. Like God, like God is the only one that directs me. God is the one who knows how many tools I should be using. And I need to be really careful if I'm picking up the tools as a way to control my recovery. I don't need God, thanks. I've got the tools. And I'm not, you know, the tools are incredibly helpful. We need the tools, but not as a substitute for my higher power. The tools will not keep me sober. Only God keeps me sober. And so I have to keep, I have to go into prayer and I have to say, God, I still don't know what to do. Even though I think I do, I don't. And I need your help, right? You need to show me who I should be working with, what my day should look like. Step 11 on awakening. What does that look like? Step 11, you know, evening inventory. Like, how did I do? Not so great. You know, okay, tomorrow I'm going to try again with God's help. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Catherine. I have one more quick question based on something you shared fairly early on in this share, and then we'll start wrapping this up. You know, you mentioned that at some point in your life, you did therapy, you took some meds on uh, antidepressant, and all of a sudden that silenced the crazy in your head. Talk to me a little bit about, do you still use those meds today? Is that is that crazy now able to be, what does that look like today? Yeah, so I, I was on Prozac three times in, in my life, but that was, gosh, many, many years ago. Um, I think I came off like sort of early to mid-30s, and, and I'm 42 now. So, um, yeah, I I don't have that mental obsession, you know. Um, I've been, God has removed that from me. I don't have that, you know, even, even in recovery, I used to get really excited for breakfast. I couldn't wait to have Reggie. Yay. And I don't think about that anymore. You know, I, I don't have the mental obsession around my body weight and shape. And that's by working the program, working the steps. That's what got removed. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much, Catherine, for a fantastic RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting. If you in the live audience have additional questions, please consider either joining our WhatsApp community by emailing me at rico12pod at gmail.com. I can get you connected in there. Or you can just email me and if you have a question directly for Catherine or would like to connect with her, email me. I'll make sure that that connection happens from, 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 this, from this angle. If you haven't already done so, Please consider rating and reviewing Rico 12 podcast in Apple Podcasts. It really helps us work our 12th step and get this message out to more people who really need these stories and these, these experiences, strength and hope. 
Next Friday, we're going to hear from Kevin and Angie H. We're going to have another couple speaker for us, and, and their topic will be, you were stronger than my lust. And I think it's going to be really powerful. I think uh, I'm looking forward to it. Stay tuned in our WhatsApp community and on our email list for more information on, on what we've got going on. Now, let's launch off into the rest of our day with the serenity prayer that Catherine will say for us. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. Be you in charge. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Catherine. And everybody, remember there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find God now. Keep coming back. Work it. You are worth it. Still searching